everybody. I'm Joan Oriel, president of the Petaluma Museum. Welcome to Wings in Space, our tribute to the space shuttle program. Amazing program. If you stop and think about it. I kind of grew up in the 80s, went to high school, and, and watching all these shuttle flights. And 30 years, you know, over 125 missions. I mean, it's, it's amazing the accomplishments that took place with the space shuttle. Um, you think of Hubble, you know, wouldn't be there without the space shuttle. I mean, the International Space Station, and of course, you know, the tragedy of Challenger and Columbia. I mean, a real human interest story. So we're so pleased to be able to have this exhibit here for you folks to appreciate. Uh, thanks to a lot of people, uh, the Space Station Museum in Nevada, a lot of these wonderful uh, space station, or excuse me, shuttle artifacts on loan. If you get a chance to go up and visit those folks, uh, very generous of them to lend us some neat stuff. Uh, our good friends with Sonoma State and Santa Rosa Junior College, always wonderful supporters of our exhibits. Uh, our volunteers and our docents, uh, Liz Cokey back there, uh, Solange Rusick right there, thank you so much Solange and Mary Rowe, uh, our great staff here at the Petaluma Museum put this together. Um, hi Carol. And of course our, our speaker today is, is an absolutely amazing, amazing images. But before we get started, uh, we have any shuttle experts out here, any space shuttle experts? I've got some tickets from the uh, Santa Rosa Junior College Planetarium, and I've got two for someone who could tell me who, what the first shuttle mission was in space. Does anybody know what the oh. first shuttle, or the name of the first shuttle? Columbia. Perfect. Okay, okay. honey. Good All right, good job. Yay! All right. Yay! Columbia, Columbia was the SPS-1, first mission into space. Uh, the last, anybody know the last? Name of the last shuttle. Yes, yes sir. Who was it? What Atlantis. Oh, uh, very good, S-1. Well done, so thank you so much. Oh, honey, I'm so proud of you. So, what, our speaker today, wow, you guys are lucky. I mean, it's just incredible, the talent that actually is in this community. I'm always, always amazed. Uh, you probably won't find a more imaginative, creative person. Um, he's been up close with Forrest Gump. You know, he's, he's seen the T-Rex at Jurassic Park. He has unveiled the Matrix to us all as a supervisor at Industrial Light and Magic. He's won an Academy Award. Uh, as a visual effects artist, I mean, just an amazing, an amazing talent, and also an incredible photographer, and has been in a, uh, taking pictures with the Apollo missions, and of course the shuttle, uh, which is wonderful images are here today. So with that, I'd like to introduce George Murphy. Thank you, Jeff. So thank you guys for being here today. It's kind of fun to be able to, to talk to you and share some of the things. Uh, you know, the, uh, the images on the wall here from the last shuttle mission, you know, Joe, Joe was asking what was the first, what was the last shuttle mission. Well, those are the only two missions that I actually was able to be down there for. I started out uh, in Florida, um, and I'll, we'll get a little bit into history, but, uh, but covering the space program from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and I was down there. The, the first shuttle mission was actually the last time I was in Florida before I went off and, and did other things. But uh, so I don't know. Maybe getting a little bit of background. How you know? How did I end up uh, here doing what I'm doing? Because I have this very sort of almost contradictory career, um, and I kind of well here. Let's let's get some some images going here to back this up here. That's uh, sweaty and hot and humid in front of the space shuttle, <laughs> carrying too much gear, but. Uh, and, and the gist of the talk, one of the things I'm doing in this talk today is I want to sort of share with you just some of my experiences covering the space program. And because to me, you know, it's, it's not like any of the journalists here are writing up in space, but what, and so you're trying to figure out what is it about this process? What is it about being there that seems to matter, makes it so important? And I think it's, you know, this that visceral sense of instead of just reading about it or seeing it, to be, to be there and watch the things of space happen, even if they disappear and they go off into the sky. And, and do their thing, somehow that makes it more real. You feel like you're a part of something. It's just like any group where somebody that you know does something and makes that whole group feel like they've somehow taken part in that thing. And I think for me, um, that was a big part of it. Now, I, uh, I kind of was grounded in uh, the arts and sciences. When I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, I was very involved with, actually it was a museum of arts and sciences there that I was very involved with, because uh, I always, 
my family, we had a very creative visual background, but I also, you know, felt very comfortable with technical things. And this was sort of a great it was heaven for me to be able to explore both of those things. Uh, got very involved in uh, the shows that we were producing there at the uh, planetarium, and uh, actually was, sh you know, shot this photograph doing. That was part of what I ended up doing there. I started getting into multimedia back when multimedia didn't mean just a video on the web. It was actually film and audio tapes and slides and you know, all of these in illustrations and all these different media that you would put together to do these shows. And as part of that, I, you know, started getting involved in this sort of, on one hand, in this educational world of science education with the museum, and that's actually was my introduction to going down to the Kennedy Space Center as part of, on a sort of more of an educational role. But um, at, I was also very much an aspiring photographer at the time, photojournalist, in term, at that point, uh, still in high school, and wanting, but wanting to get involved in that side of things. So the storytelling side of that meant a lot to me as well. So gradually over time as I was down at the Cape, um, my role shifted from sort of being there as, a, as an educator communicator to sort of more of a journalist. As, and we'll get into some of that as we go for, forward. Um, ironically, you know, in some ways, this journalistic bent that I could have gone on the straight educational bent, um, the same background that I had working at the museum, being involved in multimedia and imagery, also happened to be sort of a great foundation that started moving me in the direction of visual effects and film. And I started getting involved in uh, digital technologies very early on. I mean, the million dollar system that I started out on, one of the first ones, you know, your, your iPhone can do more than it could do <laughs> at the time. But people were, you know, their jaws were on the floor. How do you airbrush and paint and cut and paste images on a computer? Uh, and I'm giving away some of my age now, but uh, back in the, in the 80s when I was first getting involved in that stuff, it wasn't commonplace because it was so expensive. But that gradually led to me getting involved in commercial work, which led me getting involved to relationships with supervisors and directors at ILM, which gradually led me to going to ILM to start working on feature films, and you know, from there things, uh, things have gone on. I was at ILM for 10 years, uh, worked on a number of films there. Uh, you know, I quite being there, it's a little bit like, there's a lot of really talented people. I mean, everybody's got their skills and their talents and everybody works hard at things. If you stand in the road, you can get hit by the truck. And being at ILM was like standing in the road. So, you know, by do, doing the same work I might have been doing in some other context, just as hard, just as talented, that wouldn't get seen. But by being at ILM, I had the good fortune that that work was more visible. And it, it just led to good things. So, um, you know, got the opportunity to work on these, these highly visible films and with the thing about all that work and the thing it teaches you too is it is such a collaborative effort. There's no, you know, unlike those actors that can say, oh, I did this thing. When you're in the post-production side of it and visual effects, it is a team process. I mean, it is about the people you work with and collaboration. And in a lot of ways, I always feel like I work for my crews or I work for all these other people trying to get them together. Nobody, you know, as opposed to somebody working for me. But it, it's fun because you get to get exposed to things. A lot of times it's more fun after you're done with it because it's so, you know, we will oftentimes be working, you know, or when we're working on the Matrix, which this, by the way, is uh, from the set in Sydney on one of the APUs from the two Matrix sequels uh, that had some life-size props. And then we actually had full digital versions of these things. And of course, everybody, whether it's a photo, the photojournalist or the people working on films, everybody's, everybody's a tourist when it comes to this stuff. And they all have their pictures taken <laughs> on these things. So, uh, but, uh, you know, being able to do these things has been, been pretty great. So just a quick little summary, you know, I uh, was involved in Forrest Gump. Uh, we, uh, the team we were working with, we got the whole film, we got 10 Academy Awards that year. Got to uh, get involved with uh, Star Trek First Contact, uh, the two Matrix sequels and the Wachowskis, uh, Jurassic Park when, it was interesting, that was a time when, uh, you know, now everybody's used to all this media being digital and you take it for granted and in the, film industry in particular, um, it came a little earlier than in other areas, but um, Jurassic Park was one of those first films where the studios started saying, okay, we, we need it to be done digitally, even though it, it isn't cheaper, it isn't faster, <laughs> at that time it wasn't. Um, so we had to break a lot of ground there, but it was just because suddenly people saw the potential to do things a different way. I mean, when that movie started, nobody even thought we would do all the, the digital scenes we did and the CG dinosaurs that uh, you know, Joe LaTerry, uh, who was now running What a Digital for Peter Jackson. He was one of the guys that helped figure out how to make the dinosaurs look, look right on that thing. So it was it's interesting the people you get exposed to being involved in this. Got a chance to work on the first Mission Impossible. 
went out since my good buddy at uh, Weta Digital, Joe Letary, was uh, in a bind on Kong. They had three months to go and 2,000 shots left to finish on uh, Peter Jackson's King Kong. And uh, myself and a few other people got a call to see if we were crazy enough to come out and help. And uh, it was actually a lot, a lot of fun, but uh, I managed to get the movie done. So went out there, uh, worked with a company after ILM called ESC that was owned by Warner Brothers. And that's, what we, that's where we did the Matrix work. We also did... Uh, Another Keanu Reeves movie called Constantine. And then the most recent thing is uh, we had uh, been part of a process where we set up a studio in Nevada there called Image Movers Digital. And it was uh, director Robert Zemeckis's, basically we were his studio. And it's a very, it was like a Pixar-like company designed to do digital features. And you know, his goal was to take uh, performances from actors and get those actors into this digital realm. And, the technology has not always been there for that. There's all these issues about whether it's creepy or whether it works or not. And, but he was on this road because he thinks there's the value of what the actors brought to that. So that's what that studio was about. And we did Christmas Carol. We were working on a potential new version of Yellow Submarine where it was finally starting to look like something that might work. But uh, changes in, uh, in high level management at Disney and when those people went, we kind of went. So, uh, so we found new jobs for 500 people. <laughs> <laughs> but we had plenty of warnings. So it, it was all good. So anyway, so a little background on the, on the film. So I've had this one foot in this completely synthetic, artificial fantasy world. And I have this other foot in this photojournalistic, real, truthful, honest world where you need to be true. You know, I guess what it, what it sort of puts me in this position is if I always have to think about being true to the integrity of the intended medium. I don't want my work in visual effects to take away from the credibility of my work when I'm doing documentary or journalistic work. And I think, you know, there's a lot of trust involved in that because as you've all seen in the news and things, you know, people take liberties with that because it, you can't tell anymore. And it's easier for more people to do that. I remember when we finished Forrest Gump and we had made, you know, all the past presidents say things they hadn't said and done these things. Um, and I gave a talk and I said, I work for the biggest bunch of liars in the world. Because <laughs> we were, we were changing reality. But in that context, of course, you know, you, you accept that. You expect that something was going on. But everybody was really worried, oh my gosh, is this going to change things? And at that point, it was like, now, do you know how hard it is to do that? Nobody can do that on the fly. Now, it's a different story. You have to, you know, you, you do have to trust the credibility of your sources. And it's easy for a lot of people to do very believable stuff. So, so I certainly, from my point of view, you know, work very hard to try to maintain this idea that, you know, um, if something's supposed to be, the content is supposed to be true, then it's just about presentation versus this other world where if you're creating fantasy and, or if it's fine art or things like that, where you're as an artist, you're, you're bringing a, a more manipulative vision to the thing, that that's okay. But, you know, it, it, what it requires is dialogue. You just have to be, be clear. So there's a whole other thread that I'll get into sometime that would be fun to talk about with everybody about just that whole issue of trust in the media and where this goes. Because in my world, those two worlds are colliding now. I mean, it used to be publishing and print and still imagery was a silo. Cinema and film and entertainment was another silo. But on your iPad now, in one publication, they all mingle together and they're all part of the same presentation. So those worlds are all coming together. And for me, that's really exciting because it means all these different things that I've been doing might actually get to live in the same place. <laughs> here. So I'm, I'm excited about where that will go. So anyway, so enough sort of background stuff. What I want to get into is now just talking about some of my experiences uh, covering the space program and kind of where that went. And, and afterwards, love to open up to questions and dialogues or things that maybe, you know, you experienced. So this was how I saw my first launch. <laughs> Apollo 17. And I was a kid. We went down on a school bus and it was a long way away. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was the last moon mission. But it, even at that distance, though, it was such a physical thing and so such a memorable thing that uh, um, it's something you never forget. And it obviously made a big impression on me. Growing up on the space coast of Florida, I was always, you know, and just naturally being interested in space and the sciences anyway, um, it was just a great opportunity to sort of be able to get closer to the space program. So as, as time went on, and I got involved with the museum and could get a little closer and had more reason to be closer. Um, I started going down and photographing some of these other missions on a, um, 
just to start to record. Now here I wasn't fully accredited. This is actually still from Titusville. This is the first Skylab mission. Uh, they're launching actually the Skylab unit itself up on, on this Skylab and then the manned missions would follow. But even from this distance, uh, it's amazing the force and the power this sort of stuff has. This is, they had the, the moon missions had ended, but they had all the Apollo vehicles still and they were purposing them to, for Skylab, which actually ran for a very short period of time, but it was the precursor to understanding some of the things we needed to know to start setting up the International Space Station. So it was, a, it was actually a very important mission, and a lot of science was, was taken care of on that. So, but this was one of the last times you ever saw one of those, a Saturn V, or this was the last time you ever saw a Saturn V lift off from uh, planet Earth here. Then by the time things went around, I obviously skipped a Skylab in there, but by the time uh, Skylab 3 came around, I was actually now getting accreditation to go to the Kennedy Space Center and be at the press site and looking at all this great equipment all these other guys had that I certainly couldn't afford because I was still pretty young. Uh, but, you know, I would rent stuff and, you know, had some, was a much better perspective on the rockets and what was going off there and being able to talk to the press office and the people around. You just, there's a, there's a, there's an energy in a buzz. It's like going to, almost like going to a concert when you go there and you anticipate and everybody's excited about the importance of what's going on or the, the event you're about to see because it's this special rare moment. And, and these things don't, don't happen every day. And so even with these you know, hardcore news media, there's still that kind of almost carnival atmosphere about you know, what, a, what a crazy exciting thing it is to watch these rockets lift off and then follow the missions afterwards. Now, with the Apollo programs, of course, you never got to see them come back down. But. So the last Skylab 4, um, all of these happened in 1973, I believe. Uh, then I started getting involved because, okay, one thing getting accredited and you could go to the press site and photograph the things. And then you started to discover, oh, well, they have all these photo ops. Like there's the sunset photo op and there's the dawn photo op. And all these things that you have to get up or stay up for and lose sleep. So, you know, I started participating in those things, which... Uh, well, one of the byproducts of this was I started to get to know the press office there and the people there, which started to give me um, familiarity and access that ultimately would uh, pay off a little bit down the road. Uh, for the last one, there were opportunities like we went up to the roof. How many of you know what the Vehicle Assembly Building is? Do you, that's that big building at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, it's big enough that it actually has its own weather inside. It's, uh, and it was tall enough that they could roll, you know, have a whole upright Saturn V rock, Apollo rocket inside. Well, when they started going to these smaller Saturn 1B rockets, they kept the same launch gantries and just put them on this pedestal. They called it a milk stool. And uh, they still use the vehicle assembly building for that. And uh, so there were some opportunities to go up and, and uh, survey the perspective. So the track runs from the vehicle assembly building out to the launch complex, is uh, launch complex 39, which has two pads on it, pad A and pad B. Uh, all of the Skylab missions were running from pad B because they were getting ready to start um, deconstructing pad um, A pretty soon for, uh, for, for the shuttle missions to start prepping that. And that vehicle that's moving along there is, is a, called a crawler and that moves along about a mile and a half an hour. Uh, it takes a long time to get out there, but you're moving a 30-story building so you kind of want to be a little careful how fast you go. Uh, so then for the launch of Skylab 4, you can see the quality of the images are getting a little better. I'm figuring out, <laughs> I'm starting to know what I'm doing. I'm using better stuff. The film's getting better too at that point as well. Um, but, uh, you know, running a little bit longer lenses and, you know, it's, and again, even at three, the press site's three miles from the rocket. And, you know, you'll see in some other pictures, it's like, darn, can you even see the thing <laughs> from that distance? But uh, it is amazing how physical the sensation is even at that distance, the noise and the sound and the, and the vibration, um, you, you wouldn't want to be much closer. Um, so as Skylab wrapped up and the manned missions were starting to get um, slowed down a little bit, although there was still Apollo uh, Soyuz coming, um, I also was starting to go down for some of the uh, unmanned missions or satellites and a lot of these are being launched from the Air Force Base there off of these Delta rockets and some of these other Air Force uh, vehicles and sometimes actually it was more interesting. You started thinking, okay, I'm taking pictures from this place where there's a thousand other people taking the exact same picture. What can you start doing to show it in a fresh way? Because, yeah, you know, you're all looking at the same thing, but it's, it's amazing how different those images can ultimately be and how much you can bring to an image just on your own. For this one, actually, 
went south of the cape and didn't even go under the cape and was on the beach south of there just so I could get the arc of the rocket going up. And this was uh, just some satellite. Which satellite? I don't even. Actually, I would have to look up this one. Then I went to there's some other launches I went to. On a lot of the satellite launches, all for some reason tend to happen at night, and um, you know, the launch windows tend to work out that way. Uh, one of the nice things about the smaller launches, you can get a lot closer. There's a lot, you know, there's not such a, a safety zone, and sometimes they're, they're just spectacular and beautiful. The way that you know the lighting comes and they, they light up the sky. They're these very dramatic, uh, dramatic events. Um, there's a lot less media for these. Launches. Actually, half the media are there, I think, only hoping that something goes wrong and they can be there to catch that disaster <laughs> moment. Because, you know, there was a time when the rockets weren't as stable and occasionally a satellite would blow up or something. And it's been a long time since we've seen a lot of that kind of stuff. I mean, shall, shuttle uh, disasters aside, but from the smaller rocket side, uh, it has tended to be more stable. One of the other really unique opportunities that happened uh, before the uh, Viking lander went to Mars. Uh, and they were getting, that was another one of these small, smaller uh, rockets that was going up. Uh, they invited the press to come down and go into the clean room there and take pictures of the rocket, of the, of the um, craft before it got completely housed in the shroud there and sent on its way to Mars. So uh, we all got to dress up in these clean suits and go through all this great decontamination stuff, which was a lot of fun. And, uh, but it was called the white room there. And the, uh, Inside that sort of round place is where the Mars lander is housed, and the rest of the structure would get mounted inside the upper end of the rocket, and then a big nose cone would be put around that casing, uh, and that would begin its, uh, its uh, many month long journey to, to Mars. Um, of course, everybody running around in their, in their bunny suits uh, and uh, taking as many pictures of each other as they were of the rock. <laughs> that was. So that's how young I was when I was doing that. Um, so that was me. And then uh, about the same time, the Voyager spacecraft were, get, were, were not too far off of that, actually. It's a, a little different year on that. But the Voyager spacecraft were getting ready to go. And Carl Sagan, who was involved in the committee to, uh, the, if you've heard of the Golden Record, a lot of, a lot of you have. And this idea that you know the Voyager spacecraft would eventually be leaving the solar system, and in fact, right now the first Voyager craft is breaking the outer bounds of the solar system is the farthest object that has ever been put in space by humans, and uh, is hitting that point of no return. It will be an interstellar space here very soon, which is pretty crazy to think about it, uh, and still running. And they expect it to be able to send back data till 2025, which is um, which is pretty crazy. So. One of the things on those, both of those spacecraft is this record, in case you don't know about it, which has um, bits of our human culture with the off chance that if some other alien life form intelligence came across this thing, they might be able to learn a little bit about who we were. And uh, there's also a roadmap how to get to us, and maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> maybe not, I don't know. Um, trust is a good thing, but you never know, you know? Nature tends to be doggy. <laughs> But hopefully it'll, it, it would be a good thing if somebody found it. But it's pretty amazing what's on this record. And if you've heard the Murmurs of Earth, which is the audio portion of this, there's some, some amazing stuff. Carl Sagan has um, also sp started that Cosmo series that if any of you ever saw that. And it sounds like there's a reboot of that starting up soon. So um, it should be some interesting things. So anyway, so I was pretty excited to see him, who was a great science educator and very passionate, and see the record. and. Uh, this was the rocket uh, that that was going up on. The, it's a called a Titan 3E Centaur. Uh, and there were two of these. And actually, Voyager 2 lifted off before Voyager 1. Their orbits would take them in a path that would actually make them uh, sort of change hands there a little bit. But that's what the inscription, there's, a, there's coding that somebody who's intelligent in, in math and science, some culture, would be able to decipher a lot of information about who we are. Uh, and the liftoff of, uh, this was a Voyager 1 taking off there. So that was, a, it was pretty exciting to be able to see that kind of get going. So then we got back to uh, some of the uh, manned missions here, the last manned mission for this Apollo era, Apollo Soyuz. And in Apollo Soyuz, in a lot of ways, I mean, there was some science, but it really was, there's one last rocket to use, there's a lot of goodwill to establish, and actually the most important thing that Apollo Soyuz was about was about 
establishing a relationship with another country in space as opposed to it just being Americans in space. And in fact, we docked with the Russians, opened the door and shook hands was, was, was significant from a political point of view as, as, as anything. Uh, and certainly more money has been spent on less valuable things <laughs> in time. There was science on board, but this, was, so this, but this really kind of brought an end to the whole Apollo era. And as such, there was tremendous interest in this last launch. I mean, almost, it's very equivalent to what, like the ending of the shuttle program. Uh, and at, at that point, the, uh, the, the number of media that had signed up and were, by the thousands were funneling into the uh, Kennedy Space Center there. And there's a view, by the way, that the side of the vehicle assembly building with the, the rocket uh, attached there. These are our astronauts. So it was Deke Slayton on the left there and uh, uh, Tom Stafford in the middle and Vance Brand on the right. Uh, they flew the last Apollo mission and of course, bevy of uh, photographers there taking the photo op. Sometimes the media was more interesting than the actual thing they were covering. Yeah. Just, um, I, I, I tend to, even on, on when I'm working on film projects, I'm always photographing the people and stuff behind the scenes because I don't know, there's just something interesting about the people that are part of the process because to me that's as much the story as what you end up seeing in the, in the visible front. Uh, so the Rocket was on its way out to the uh, to the launch pad, and so a, a new opportunity came up where they were saying they were taking ten groups of news media time out to the crawler to get on board and ride the elevator up and come out at capsule level thirty feet above and look out on this. So uh, to me, this was like you know as close to space as I was ever going to get. I couldn't believe that I was was there. So we came out at capsule level and. We're one level below where the crane is. Well, the shot I wanted to get, I could, there was all this other stuff going on, so I actually snuck up one more tier. Escort wasn't looking. And at the top, there was what, this level, and then there was this little gangway with just a chain link at the end of it, 30 stories up. And I walk out onto that, and that's where I, I was able to shoot this picture from. And it was just, and I had to shoot, this is actually, I had to shoot three different pictures and stitch them together to get uh, this wide an angle of view, because I'm looking straight down to, to straight out, but uh, that was a pretty amazing experience. And to me, you know, feeling like this was the end of the Apollo program, and this last chance to see what was going on with this, I was—I felt really fortunate to, to be able to take advantage of that and uh, experience that. So back at the press site on this mission, they actually put a plaque up commemorating the fact that this was, you know, where the largest number of news media in history had gathered to report on the events that got on there. And, um, and I think everybody that was there feels like they were, you know, touching a part of something in some small way, you know, even though, you know, it's funny, you're there, you're not the thing, the thing is the thing going on in front of you, but just being there makes you somehow feel like you're, uh, you're you know, more involved in that thing. So, Apollo are still really beautiful rockets, and this one was set up across from one of these pools, so there was a chance to do that. Lots of media, so they had bus loads to bring everybody in. Uh, and then the old press site, this structure doesn't exist there anymore, they've torn it down, but this was the, uh, the media were piling in and lots and lots of multi-camera rigs. Nobody wanted to miss the chance. And yes, it is a circus there. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then my, my lonely single lens, <laughs> this is me, but this gives you, know, this is the size of the rocket on the pad from where we are. This is, this is what you're, but this is what you're, you're getting with the right right optics uh, back then. Although, so it's uh, and off it goes, and then of course the. Remember when TVs looked like this? <laughs> it wasn't as long ago as you think. So the picture of from all of the stuff with the Apollo thing to me that actually almost meant the most was we went back out and photographed the empty pad after the mission because to me this was this is the end of Apollo and that empty pad sort of said okay what next at least at least when Apollo ended there was a clear vision for the shuttle program you know development was already underway they were immediately you know start converting you know started converting some of the one of the pads over pad A over so there was an understanding that it was happening it was just going to take five or six years to get there uh, which is very different from how everybody felt when the last shuttle sort of took off. Um, so in the lull in between, I had an opportunity to uh, 
go back down to the Cape on, it was really, you know, in that in-between time, there's not a lot going on. So, you, you know, you could, you, they were pretty accommodating in the press office there to give you an escort, take you wherever you wanted. What do you want to see? What do you want to do? Just any publicity right now would be good because nobody's talking about NASA because nothing was going on. Uh, so I had rented this big old NICOR fisheye lens. The glass is about that big. It was like one of the ones you saw in the clean room there. I'm like, God, well, let's go around and shoot some stuff at the Cape with this thing. Um, and so we went up on top of the vehicle assembly building and you can see the beginnings of the shuttle work going on. These two buildings here are the orbiter processing facilities uh, for when the shuttle lands and comes back. And you can see out there the runway where they were constructing the shuttle runway, the landing strip for the runway. And later on you'll see some pictures of after the, 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 the last shuttle landing and they do what's called the, the rollover where they roll it from the landing bay to the uh, order processing. This is the road they're coming across. So it gives you a little context. And then there's the old um, gantry that was no longer going to be used for the shuttle stuff. Although oddly enough, in the upcoming missions, they're refurbishing it because it will be the right size for, for some of the new uh, uh, space lift systems. So uh, it's going to get back in action. So inside the orbiter processing facilities is you know huge array of just framework and stuff. But basically, they can roll the the orbiters and the space shuttles in there and they can you know, put things, you know, they can load up some of the cargo bays, they can refurbish things that need to be taken care of. So the facilities were being designed for that. They were starting to test out new uh, mission control consoles. Uh, and then the vehicle assembly building, which is, continues to do what it has always done. It is where once the, the rocket components are ready to go, they are brought together and they're put together like the shuttle is put together with the solid rocket boosters and put onto the crawler in the vehicle assembly building. But it required them to be cutting and engineering new cut platforms so that engineers and workers could get at every level of the, of the shuttle. So all the old Apollo rigging was being pulled out and they were putting in new ones. It's a little hard to tell from this, but this is a huge, like 20 story volume you're looking at there. Then we went out to the shuttle pad while it was under construction, so they were still building it. They were guys welding on the, the this would be the deflector where the blast from the shuttle launches would push out the flame. Uh, they were constructing part of that large structure to the left of the red tower um, will roll up and cover the shuttle when it's there and help with final fitting of um, you know, maintenance issues, potentially sometimes last minute uh, the cargo things can be put in, all that would be an unusual situation, but it just gives them access to the entire shuttle uh, when it's in an upright position out at the pad. And then looking down on some of the construction, there's, um, I actually don't know the figure off the top of my head, but there's just some tremendous amount of concrete poured into this whole base here because they were, you know, the shuttle taking off with the solid rocket motors burned at a much hotter temperature than the liquid fuel motors, and so they had to be able to to deal with the fact that the, uh, the thrust was going to be higher temperature and shut it off the right way. So uh, some other, this time looking down from the, uh, from the launch gantry itself. The guys welding away on the, on the platforms. So that was my last Florida space experience for a while and I had come out to California and was working, um, had, was, had gone to school up at the UW and was working on some things uh, on the West Coast, and uh, decided to take an opportunity to go visit Rockwell International, which is where they were building space shuttle engines, and they were um, they had a facility out at uh, Palmdale where they were actually applying the tiles to the space shuttles. Uh, this is the Enterprise, which was sort of the test shuttle uh, on the left, and they've got uh, the wing. I'm I'm not 100% sure, but I'm like 98% sure that there's another shuttle in another bay there, and I believe that is the Challenger under construction, and that that's the tail fin for the Challenger there. Uh, but this is where the guys were assembling. You know, they're, they're, they're cleaning the surfaces, they're fitting the tiles very precisely. It was all kind of happening there. This is the, the bay with the Enterprise, and then there's a similar bay one over. Yeah, you can see the black tiles and the white tiles, and they're there's very, very methodical. Each one goes in just the right place. Uh, this was the Challenger under construction and before they put any of the tiles on it. Um, and then at their other facility in Canoga Park, they were assembling shuttle main engines. And literally, you know, a guy's 
engineers by hand are putting in these tubes. And these tubes carry this liquid coolant that keeps the funnel from actually burning up. Well, it's actually part of the, the you know, the fuel is, is, is cold, but it goes through there and it also helps support the uh, nozzle from burning up. Um, but it's a, it's a meticulous process, uh, what they're going through on that. So some years pass, <laughs> and we get to the actual first shuttle launch. Um, I was back in Florida at the time and uh, wasn't going to miss this for the world. This, by this time, I had moved on from you know, just doing stuff at the museum, and I was actually accredited you know, through some uh, photo agencies. I was doing stringer work for an agency out of New York called Black Star, which was an, a news and mag editorial uh, agency. And, uh, and went out, and uh, so they were starting the first, the, the first shuttle launch. And this is on the crawler way, so instead of that 30-story building, now there's the, the shorter shuttle, although it's pretty big, and these stones uh, along the way, which actually, yeah, one of these stones, <laughs> um, that the crawlers and the Apollo rockets and the shuttles have all crawled across um, on its way out there. Um, So yes, Columbia, another ill-fated <coughs> shuttle. Um, but at the time, you know, it was, was the beginning of the program. Uh, there was full moon setting uh, at dawn. On the left is sort of, and they had that that roll rat, that uh, rolling structure, uh, mobile service structure. There was covering up the shuttle on the left, and then, and this was back when they started out with the white tanks too. That's very. You notice all the tanks have been orange since then, and they just. Uh, of, uh, you know, they were, they just decided they were painting it for cosmetic reasons for no reason at all, so they <laughs> decided to stop spending that money. Um, and this was a shot that not everybody could get, because if you weren't standing 10 feet to my right or left, you didn't get the sun behind the, <laughs> the rocket. Um, it's still pretty big, even though it's not tiring. They had SWAT team walking along the base of the crawler, keeping all the news media at least 100 yards back. At that point, they were very nervous about you know, those solid rocket boosters are fully loaded and ready to go, you know. And uh, unlike the previous, all the other rockets that are empty when they're carried out to the pad. So uh, everybody's a little nervous the first time around, but, uh, you know, nothing big. And there was a lot of attention there. Out in the surrounding area, in the Cape, the crowds had come by the millions. It's just so... Uh, these people with an RV let us climb on top of their RV so we could just take a photograph of this sea of people that were there to watch that first launch. It was very hard getting in and out of the, out of the Cape when it got close to launch because uh, it was just a lot of traffic. So as you know, you've heard that the press site is three miles away from liftoff. There's safety reasons for that and logistical reasons for that. Well, for the first launch, they had this thing called the advanced press site, and it was a mile and a half closer. And they were maybe 40, 50 people at that. This is where I said going to the Cape and getting to know those people all that time and doing those small little things paid off because I was able to be on the list and get at the advanced press site. Now, if anything had gone wrong, I might not be standing here today. But, um, and it was just, you know, they just set this thing ad hoc um, up at some utility building that was there. The networks, uh, you know, set up some, uh, uh, some facilities there for doing their broadcasting closer in. And, of course, all the big lenses were out for, uh, for this one. <laughs> Got to keep those things clean. Uh, I had a small telescope arrangement, actually, that would uh, give me the kind of magnification I was looking for. So, yeah, it's just a small but very powerful array of photographers. <laughs> uh, they almost made as much noise as the rocket when it took off. So, uh, so from there, you know, I was able to... Um, and get a great shot of the, the liftoff, but also this is uh, after it's flying in the solid rocket, motors have detached and they're starting to fall away. And the shuttle is now going up on just main engine power. So uh, you don't always, usually there's, even if there's a little cloud cover, you don't always get to see those except in those super NASA tracking scopes that somehow can, can track that stuff very stably. So that took me to the end of the first shuttle mission and then my career took me away and busy in other parts of the world and I, a lot of stuff happened in 30 years of shuttle program <laughs> between then and, and the last shuttle, you know, Hubble got launched, several other 
uh, satellites, the space station started to get built, a lot of international cooperation with astronauts, you know, American astronauts going up in Soyuz spacecraft, other countries' astronauts going up in ours. Um, you know, in some ways, you know, NASA's goal with the shuttle was to make going into space mundane, make it easy and simple. The trouble is when it's mundane, people stop caring about it. It's not as glamorous anymore. People lose sight of what's so important about it. So in some, you know, they almost wonder if they, by making it mundane, you know, it wanted to be a space trucking company. I mean, you know, it wants to be that easy that you think of, okay, we need to use space, let's just use it. And that's the way it should be. But it lost that magic of, you know, space exploration that inspires a lot of people. And I think that affected a lot of the support over the years for what we're doing in space and even the vision that should be developing for what's going on with that. So um, as the shuttle program started to wind down, I think you, know, you saw people realizing, oh, yeah, we got to start thinking about that again. Well, the mission was ending, and I was darn well not going to miss the last launch, <laughs> having been there. Because the, there weren't that many people that were at the first one that were at the last one. Um, and uh, although I'd wish I'd been to a few in between because, you know, that ability to try things out and experiment and, you know, with different kind of camera setups would have, would have been helpful. But anyway, I, uh, so I knew for this one that I wanted to have the right kind of access, so I actually contacted uh, our local guys, the Press Democrat and uh, Chad uh, Cermic over there and said, if you guys will accredit me, you'll get first rights, I'll write some stories and do some things and I'll get the kind of access I want and can do stories. So, uh, they were all on board with that, and um, so, which was great because the Press Democrat has great circulation, and when it comes to the press office, what you get to do there is all based on how much exposure they think what you're going to do is going to get. And you know, 300,000 plus circulation at the time um, allowed me to get access to things that I might not otherwise have had. So that was that was pretty that was pretty great doing that. So. I'm going to go through a couple parts of the experience uh, here. Um, one of the first things before the launch is all about, okay, what are you going to do to set up? This time I wanted to set up remote cameras near the launch pad. Uh, I'd um, done a lot of development with some guys that were set, had remote triggers that were triggered by audio. A lot of people were setting up remote cameras. Um, it's a tough thing. You know, there's like a 50% failure rate for remotes because you set them up and then maybe you won't get at them for three days. If the rocket's delayed, they still have to go off. Uh, so you test and test and test and check and check and check. Um, you also have to get up at every hour of the morning because for some reason NASA decides you're going to be getting on a bus at 6 a.m. And Well, to get a good spot in line, you better be there at 4 a.m. Or maybe you've slept in your car so that you don't miss out because you don't even know there's a bus going out if you're not sitting in the press center. Um, you learned that to find out what was going on, you had to hover around the right places. But um, And it was, you know, the kind of thing where you just, if you had you know, 10 crates of gear, you load it on the bus yourself and you kind of did it. They had the sniffer dogs, were definitely security was a concern. Everybody would pile on the buses with their gear, you know, and head out towards the, the launch pad, and always with an escort. And then uh, we start uh, taking media to the outer zones around the pad, the perimeter area where a lot of, and everybody, this is, again, it's, you're talking about something that's photographed every which way, and now for 30 years it's been photographed, you know, everybody's trying to their hat. How do you shoot something unique? An interesting foreground, something different. A lot of people like to set up multiple cameras. Uh, so they're all trudging with all their gear and they're setting up sound triggers or light triggers and putting them in every form of weatherproof casing. Uh, I saw converted uh, toolboxes with lids so you could get at the cameras and close them up with holes cut in the bottom. Um, a lot of people used mailboxes that were converted, these big old with front doors. People have had their cameras messed up with birds nesting in them if they waited out there too long. Um, you know, rain and weather is obviously a problem. Condensation can be uh, an issue. So everybody had their own thing. And they would, you know, set them up everywhere. Like these guys would set up on the far end of this little lagoon hoping to get the reflection uh, going. And, uh, and of course, while we're doing all this, it's about 98 degrees. It is 99% humidity. And, and I grew up in Florida, and I have never seen a batch of mosquitoes as ferocious <laughs> as the fresh crop that had grown up for, for this trip. I mean, you, if you, you could not stop for 10 seconds without your arms starting to get coated in black. It was crazy. So repellent was, was a survival, uh, definitely a survival mechanism. Also ran across this, uh, this guy, um, 
uh, Larry Moore, who was a plein air painter. I mean, any of you guys know about plein air painting? You know, where basically you set up an easel and you paint it while it live while it's happening. His father had been involved in the Apollo program and had, you know, through those connections he had access. And while all these photographers were running around desperately trying to get their cameras rigged up, he was uh, doing plein air painting of the shuttle on the pad. And later on he would um, do the same thing on the day of the launch. Now for that, you know, he did a little advanced work to kind of set the tone, but would finish it out based on seeing, seeing the launch. So um, I spent some time with him. It was interesting because I had just done a piece for uh, somebody up here on there's a lo the local plein air artist up in the Sonoma, in the town of Sonoma, they had that plein air festival. And I had just done a whole piece on that. And this guy actually knew about those and had participated. But uh, it's amazing to watch him work and how fast he was, he was going on things. So. <coughs> So then after we uh, did the outer run, there were like two or three different trips back and forth, and you never knew when they were going to actually do the right ones. You'd go out on every one of them. Uh, we got to what they called the infield, which is about 150 yards from the rocket, where you could start setting up. And I was trying to set up originally six cameras, two kind of close to where the exhaust plume would be that may or may not, if the wind was going right, see the rocket. The safety pair a little farther out, and then I wanted to set up some on the other side. And the pairs were for stereo. Um, and so I, you know, you know, you have to stake the cameras down and sandbag and do things so that they don't get just knocked over by the concussion of the rocket going off. Um, you know, protect them from weather. They're going to be out there. Um, a lot of people use plastic. I had put these all weather covers from a company called Think Tank on them, which was just enough. They were lighter weight. I opted for that instead of some big thing that I would have to transport from California. So, and it, they actually they worked out very well in terms of protecting the camera. Uh, the other great thing about being out there was we were there in this great lighting. It was getting to be dusk and the arc lights were coming out on the rocket and you know, you're in a place that you're normally not at that time of day and you got to get these great views of the rocket and well, the mosquito infested things coming out of that little swamp land right there. <laughs> um, so it was, it was a good opportunity even just to get some of, some of these kinds of images. And the, massive arc lamps that light the shuttle up. And then uh, the crew I was with, the escort had gone off to help the guys set up something on the other side of the pad and I opted to just stick with finishing up with the two that I was doing with. And, and as they had not come back and it's getting dark and the loudspeakers are going, all non-essential personnel, please clear the pad area because they're getting ready to fuel the rocket. <laughs> It's like, okay, am I going to get out of here? What's going on here? So there was, fortunately, there was another um, van not too far, and I actually had to just sit on top of all their gear and ride back out. But as we came back, they decided to set up some uh, another camera out uh, outside the pad area. And so I, I, had, I had no tripods or anything with me, so I would set my camera on the ground there on the side of the crawler way and uh, did uh, multiple exposures to catch all the tonal range in, in this, this shot. And this, photographing because it was just an amazing display there. And then back to the press center because now everybody's wanting to see what's going on. Uh, and this was, this, this shots were actually taken earlier in that day because as you can see it's still daylight out with the rocket. And, and yes, people are taking pictures with their iPhone of the monitors <laughs> with the rocket. Um, and NASA has caught on to the whole idea of tweeting and that the, they had invited these massive groups of tweeters to come and broadcast. They realized that they are a major news source now. And it's true. I mean, the way news and information is communicated, uh, these guys were treated like royalty and red carpet. And actually, busloads of news media had to stop and wait while the parade of tweeters made their way to their special. <laughs> I mean, but it's, it's encouraging to see that they're kind of realizing, you know, that there's a different kind of media out there. So day of the launch comes, uh, first thing that happens very early, and I finally understood why there were all these ladders sitting out in the parking <laughs> lot uh, by where the buses will pick you up, and they've been out there for days. Well, that's for the walkout where the astronauts come out of the building where they get suited up, and they go into the astro van to go right out to the launch pad. Um, and there's so many media in such a short space, if you don't have step stools and ladders, you, uh, you won't get a shot. <laughs> because <laughs> it's just this massive, uh, massive herd of people. But, uh, and here is the Astro van. And this, uh, the only thing this van does is, is go from where it picks up the astronauts to the pad and back. It goes nowhere else. And NASA has tried to uh, 
replace it over the years, and all the astronauts say, no, no, this is history. We want to keep this thing. So they have not let them replace the, uh, the Airstream. It's, it's, I mean, it's kind of cool, you got to admit. Looks... Well, after hours of standing in that huddle waiting, are they coming out of the kind of, you know, what are the clues? You know, you, you finally know when the guys are coming out with the helmets that, okay, they're finally going to come out. They've been standing there forever. And overhead, the uh, NASA helicopter with a guy with the long range arms, and then, of course, the uh, NASA photographer as well, but uh, security. And then finally, the guys are coming out. Uh, the shuttle team, and you know, and they're waving, and you think, oh, they're waving to the media, and it's like, no, no, they're they're not paying attention to the media. In the building, there's like a four-story building surrounding us. We're in this almost little alleyway between the two buildings. All of the support teams and the workers and the people that help these guys get into space are all there with their families and stuff, and, and they're waving at these guys, and just you know, making sure that those guys feel appreciation, they because they understand who's getting there. But it's just sort of funny. It's all these little like, yeah, you. Hey. <laughs> They're doing all these all these crazy little things, and finally they uh, they get into the van and off they go, um, getting ready for launch. So remotes are out at the pad. Now I'm heading to the main press site. No advanced press site this time. Uh, they didn't do it at all. It was probably smart. You know. And the press site is as crowded as it's ever been. The buildings have changed. And actually, um, so you can see there's rows of all the uplink trucks and there's cars and there's the network buildings and the one thing that was different is this year all the contractors for the upcoming potential things the Boeings and Lockheed's and all these guys had set up booths and exhibits as if it was a trade show because there's all this news media there and they're giving tours and they're giving presentations about the technologies they're developing next I, I just I thought that was it was like going to a tech trade show uh, but they had a captive media audience and there was a lot of a lot of them had time on their hands between things so um, but you know, it starts to get busy early. I went out, and, you know, actually staked out my position. There's a little rise there early, so that I would have a good view. Found my 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 friend Larry out there near the waterfront, and now he's laying in some stuff before the launch here, <laughs> and uh, just because you can't paint that fast, <laughs> you know. But uh, working it out, and I actually have his first uh, reproduction off of that. I got that. I got that print. And it was beautiful. He did a beautiful job. A uh, couple guys, uh, uh, this guy Christopher uh, uh, Salah here was Nikon, Canon, 4x5. He was paying no favorites to anybody. Uh, there was uh, a crew there that was part of uh, a, a whole documentary team that had been documenting the whole um, story around the last shuttle. This was a, a camera rig that was shooting in, in four directions with fisheye lenses that could be later stitched together for a, a dome dome presentation. And this is looking between my lenses at how big the rocket <laughs> is. It's a lot, it's three miles away. Uh, but I wanted a position kind of overlooking the clock and you've got the people in the foreground well, down below. I thought that might be a nice view to kind of catch some things going on. And then of course it's mission STS-135 so I had to take the picture when it was one minute and 35 seconds before liftoff. Um, and, uh, and the optics were, you know, were great, so it lift off. Uh, now there was a scare there because 30 seconds before launch, the clock held, as any of you were watching know, and you could see some guys through the lens in the foreground going, oh, what the heck? <laughs> they thought it was on, it had been postponed. And they just had a short hold, you know, they trying to be a little safe on this last one. They don't want to mess it up this last, last go around. But uh, fortunately, the um, launch window maintained and they decided to go for it. And, uh, lift off. What, what was really interesting to me was that when I looked at some of the video footage later too, um, there's this fluttering happening down there and, and I hadn't realized it before but the thrust is moving so fast it's actually going at a supersonic speed down there as it's pushing away from the rocket and it's just so uh, tremendously violent what's going on there. Now there was a little bit of a cloud cover so I didn't know how long we'd see the rocket but um, you know, did the rollover and then <coughs> Before it hit the cloud cover, it was going fast enough that you started to get the shock, you know, the, the condensation wave from just uh, just before going supersonic. So, and then it went away as far as we could see in the clouds. But there was evidence that it was still going because it cast a shadow 
<laughs> so you knew it was still going somewhere, <laughs> which was always good, you know, things being what they are. Um, but the plume was uh, pretty big. And actually, the wind wasn't blowing it, too. You can see there's the pad there. It had already drifted a little bit. Uh, this is only 53 seconds after your liftoff down below. Um, and this is a stitch of a few differences, sort of a super wide view. What's interesting in the actual, the original version of the shot, which is even taller, there's a little dot up at the top, and it's actually one of the, the tracking jets diving back through the cloud cover that had been trailing the shuttle, you know, because they have the, the NASA jets flying <coughs> up. Uh, I, I don't think, they, they don't keep up with it, but they definitely sort of do a little bit of escorting. So that was launched. Now, in between launch and landing, a uh, few days, there's, um, you know, you, Interesting time to sort of start talking to the locals and finding out what's going on. Um, it got to be too much for this program, but there's, you know, when there's all the stuff in Titusville about the space culture, you know, all the, that have been all the well-wishing signs on all the things, but all the stores and places that are built around the idea of the space shuttle. You know, the space shuttle is the symbol on the laundromat. On the, there's the space shuttle play thing in McDonald's there. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the culture on the Space Coast. And there was a, a, a lot of anticipation and concern that, you know, we didn't know what was next. There, were no, there was no plan to put everybody back to work on the next thing that was going on yet. And while well, the NASA, direct NASA employees weren't being laid off, about 3,000 contract employees in the immediate area were about to lose their jobs. And that, it was a very bittersweet mood in the air at the time, you know, talking to people because, um, well, because the other thing you realize is that it's not just, you're not, you can't just rehire new people and, and start over. There's knowledge that ha comes from knowing how to do a process that isn't even in the books. Which I was talking to one of the guys that are developing the new Apollo-like capsule, this, uh, the new Orion module, and they were developing the heat shield for that. Well, how we built the heat shields for the original Apollo capsules is lost. Nobody knows the exact recipes for that anymore, so they had to reinvent it. And that kind of anecdotal knowledge, which sometimes is just a matter of knowing, oh, well, if you do this in this order instead, even though the, you know, the engineering plans say do it this other way, it's faster and more efficient. You know, people doing a job for 20, 30 years, they, look, they understand how to make something work in ways that you don't, you know, that's just knowledge that gets lost. So there was, I think there was a lot of, you know, concern over the fact that to get back to that point of that same kind of competence and understanding, you know, even once the decision was made, and some decisions have started to be made, it will take twice as long to get to that same place you could have been if you just kept going. So, so that was interesting to explore, you know, that whole, I mean, there's this very human thing going on in that whole area, both economically and to the people that are working there. Um, finally, we come to the landing day. Um, these signs every day would sort of tip off how many days to landing. Um, and, the landing, the, the setup they have the landing, they have on the ground floor of this structure, they have all the people that are doing interviews. The second tier are the still photographers, where the trees may or may not interfere here and there. And on the tier, third tier, the only ones with a really clear view are the uh, live broadcast media. Um, so, you know, we had to pick our things. We're out there, um, we were hoping for a daylight landing, but no, it was landed an hour before sunrise. And there's just the spotlights at the end of the darn runway. Uh, so I practiced for like three hours tracking. There were some planes doing some test runs too. Tracking, because I knew I was going to have to use slow exposures. So tracking so I could track the rocket and get an exposure. And then I had to change my exposure as it fell out of the light. So I was rehearsing this thing for several hours just so I could figure out how to get it right when the thing came through. And um, give you a little bit of an idea because, it's, you know, it's like not every shot's going to be great. Um, this is kind of, so it lands behind the trees. <laughs> you can tell it's there. Then finally it comes into view for a little bit. Parachutes are kind of going out. And, but this sort of gives you an idea of the sequence that I'm doing. And you can tell by the streaking lights that it's, you know, my slow exposures and the parachute's coming out. And of course from that middle level, there's all these things between you and the shuttle. <laughs> but it's still, it's this tremendous roar. It's like an airliner, even though it's just landing on its own power there, there's this, you know, just roar of just the, uh, the wheels and the, and the sound of the shell going by. My thing can't quite keep up here, sorry. I was hoping to like stagger it like a stop motion movie. But, uh, but anyway, so it whips by and then it disappears behind the trees again. <laughs> it's like this big moment. And, and actually like half 20 minutes before it landed, 
we were watching the, spa the space station actually flew overhead, so we kind of got a little taste of both of them there. Um, so out of all that, there were really only three shots that I felt like <laughs> worked. You know, tracking it. But what's cool is you know you see in the lights in the cockpit, you see the guys in there, and I don't know. It was pretty. Uh, so it was worth all the practice just to get you know a couple of shots, right? And then it stops down the way, and what what happens when it lands is you've got all these toxic fuels that are leaking out of vents and, you know, the attitude jets and the main engine. So this uh, orbital recovery team comes in and they seal up the engines and that, that's the team that started to go there. And there's, so there's this whole orbital reco recovery crew that surrounds the shuttle and does all of this stuff at the place where it stops. And where it lands and where it stops in the runway is called wheel stop. And they hand a marker for every shuttle where their wheels have landed. And with this one it was predicted because when those wheels stopped rolling and uh, Ferguson, you know, called in wheel stop. That was the end of the shuttle program. That was the end of the 30-year program. So it was a very uh, historically important moment. Um, so they, out of the thousands of media that were there for this, we found out at the press office they were only going to allow 100 news media to come out to, to the landing strip. And this is where, thank you for the Press Democrat and good circulation, that even some of these guys that had, you know, showed up at the Cape every day, you know, but were for some small journal, you know, it allowed me access to, to go out and cover part of the landing, which was pretty great. You know, and then you had, uh, you know, Robert Cabana on the left, who's the head of the Kennedy Space Center, and Charles Bolton on the right, who is the head of NASA, and they were out there doing interviews, and of course, doing their press moment, you know, smile for the cameras, guys. Um, one of the interesting things when you're seeing the shuttle after it's returned, and one of the things highlighted in some of the shots in the exhibit here too, it's just how beat up this thing is. I mean, you know, it's been into space and re-entered, and they, the, the philosophy is we're not going to change anything unless it's just not safe anymore. It's, it, there's not a cosmetic reason to change it because that just costs money and, you know, being a, trying to be a budget-minded uh, group, they, they, you know, they're not spending that. But, you know, of course, there's always the cut here for rescue thing. Um, so. The, actually, the, the Atlantis looks fairly well. If you've uh, seen the Endeavor, it is. It looks like somebody dipped that in chocolate or something. <laughs> it's been scraped, and somebody's playing football. And so it's uh, the recovery team again. One of the groups that showed up there, because you know, it's this. It, now there's this mood of almost farewell, and you know, all the people that have worked on this program have actually. They're all now. This is their goodbyes to each other. So this almost becomes this sort of farewell, farewell party. One of the NASA workers had been doing this shuttle quilt for every mission, for every time there was a patch, she'd sew this quilt, and now the quilt was complete, and she I mean, several stories about her and some of the things. Uh, so she was out there showing that. And I was looking at the shuttle, and then noticed something going on up in the window up there, inside the, uh, the cockpit. When you come in close, it was one of the engineers deciding to hold something up for the cameras, just, you know, I don't know if he did know whether we realized it or not, but, but he was, you know, he was marking history, really. You know, the last space shuttle landing, and it marks the date, and it was just a moment, and it was, I thought, sort of him, sort of, you know, under, underlining that moment, which I thought was kind of neat. So once they're, they've got the shuttle reasonably secure, and they've got the, uh, you know, there's no more volatiles. Uh, that could be hazard to anyone, they start this rollover process where they're going to roll it back over the orbit of processing facilities that I showed you in that first thing. And they come down this thing and they allow the media to you camp out at this one place, see it coming down the road um, in all the Florida heat, and that's what the distortion is there. That's the uh, heat rising up off the ground. But I always thought this sort of looked like a, a little Transformers moment there where all the, expect them to all turn into something else as they're coming out. Um, that's how far away they really are when they're starting out here uh, in your, next to the swamp fighting mosquitoes. But um, on this occasion, you know, there's just this whole little group of people that are walking along, escorting the shuttle, uh, kind of walking at home. This is the last trip they'll be making with it. So it, it became almost this, uh, this kind of parade celebrating walking it back. And, uh, you know, they had the flag there and I mean, this could be this could be Middletown America, you know, with uh, any home oh, here. So, this image to me, this this sort of was I felt expressed that whole moment 
of all the stuff I shot out there, of just this little Norman Rockwell parade walking down the street with a spaceship behind them. But you know, but that was and they're waving and you know they're taking pictures of each other and it's, but it's this they celebrate. It's like to them it's the hero has come to roost and in the whole program was a hero and each they're all heroes to each other. But it was sort of bringing to a close this whole this whole process. Of course, you can do the uh, mind-bending inverted thing of the reflection, and you get a little different perspective, but uh, that's cheating. So. <laughs> and then, of course, more crazy views as it's going by of just how you know, worn and, and torn the, the thing is. You know, and even the, you know, all the little cracks along the engine work. But uh, it's, so, you know, it's pretty amazing technology. And you realize it's, it's, this is all 1980s technology still, you know. It's sort of like remembering that we actually sent a man to the moon on vacuum tubes, you know. That's the technology on the launch pads back in the early Apollo, so. And so, you know, that sort of concludes the, the rollover thing. Well, the last goodbyes at the, at the Space Center, uh, because this was the last day for all these people, uh, NASA threw a little barbecue party. There was a band, there was barbecues, food, hot dogs, and all the NASA workers, and they parked the shuttle there before, just outside the, the, or the, uh, the, the bay there, and had this big party for all the employees so they could sort of say goodbye, and it was, it was like a, you know, a farewell party. So this was for the NASA employees, you know, and they're having their little, yeah, their little NASA flags because it's really hot, and, uh, you know, the guys are standing there. They've got signs on their, on their windows. You know, they're as big a, big a fan and tourist as, as anybody. And then uh, for all the missions, they tended to do these large posters where everybody that's been involved and worked on signed it. And on this one, even all the, I, I signed this one, all the media, you know, just kind of get a little piece in there. And uh, the NASA brass and the astronauts came out. And, you know, these guys felt that they're always, everybody's always doing these banners for them on these missions. So they had actually done a banner and presented it to the workers. Um, I wasn't in a place where I could actually, you know, take pictures of it because it was a, it was a mob scene at that point, but they, uh, they did a nice thing. And then, you know, the astronauts are taking pictures of each other with their families. <laughs> it's that kind of a, you know, it was definitely, instead of this big high-tech process that required science and engineering on it, but it all boils down to this hugely emotional, prideful, you know, feeling that everybody had about something that was important that uh, was ending, you know, for now. So saying their last goodbyes, and then oops, this is uh, I, I was going to get into some stuff with the flyover stuff, but I'm not going to do that uh, here because I think I've gone on long, long enough. And but I, I have those pictures are up on the wall already anyway. So, uh, so what I do want to do is to scoot ahead here and because you know that last question really is. What's next? Um, this is Spaceport America, and it's just one example of things. Um, you know, there's a big push for uh, private, the privatization of space to support at least Earth orbit stuff. And actually, that makes a lot of sense that, you know, moving on with the concept of space trucking, getting people to and from Earth orbit, making that a working thing, part of our business, part of our economy. Uh, a lot of the private industries, you know, ready and stepping up. The SpaceX guys are doing their tests and they've done a successful docking with the space station. There's a couple other companies. And of course, then you have Richard Branson who's ready to make it a tourist industry of suborbital flights and they've already, they're expecting actually to, to fly this year. So, you know, we'll see. Uh, I, I was on my way back from the shuttle and was actually, uh, I did, was photographing uh, archeologists who were doing digs around the area to uh, just uh, for the state of New Mexico to preserve preserve any things that might be affected by the construction that was going on there. And it turns out that uh, a lot of even, even earlier cultures didn't live there. It was, a trans, it was a transition point for earlier cultures, so kind of appropriate that it now becomes a transition point for going into, into space. But uh, I gotta give it to Branson. He makes space stuff look like space stuff. This is really cool. Yeah, he's uh, yeah. Uh, but Questions? Yeah, yeah, and I, so I, I, I could keep talking, so I'll stop, but if I, questions, things, yes? Yeah, how, how does one get a ticket or get to go to one of the launches? How does any, any American get a ticket to go to a launch? How do, you mean, like, well, say, when, we, when 
I don't know what's going to go on with the SpaceX and the private groups, although, you know, the launches will be announced. I'm sure they'll be viewing. So the thing is, at, at the Kennedy Space Center, you can be anywhere in the area and get a pretty amazing view, of, especially with the rockets going up. And the new, ironically, the new rockets that are going to go up are going to look, look a lot more like the old Saturn V's did. You know, they're going back to these larger, heavy, vertical lift buildings with an Apollo, a bigger, but an Apollo-looking like capsule on top of it. Uh, it just holds more crew and, and does more things. So, um, you know, there's general access, and then then NASA and the Kennedy Space Center has always been good about, like, they have special viewing sites that are open to the public that they, you know, they sell advanced tickets to, and you just go online. You can, you know, it's easy to get to, but they, they you know, when an event comes up, they sell out fast. They were doing that for all the, the shuttle launches. You could go to the visitor center at the Kennedy Space Center and watch the launch from there. You know, so they had public places that were not quite as close, but you know, three miles or five miles actually doesn't make that big a difference. <laughs> you know, if you're just there to watch the experience and feel it, you'll, you'll feel it just as, as much. And then they have, of course, monitors set up so you actually can see as good a view of it as, uh, as anybody because they've got the closed circuit televisions on the actual launch as well. So I'm sure that'll happen again, although NASA isn't planning to launch their own, I mean, the next manned, Man, and I say man, I mean human. Sorry, the old nom nomenclature there, because now it's it's all of us. Um, probably 2019. You know, there'll be tests for now. That's not to say that the private the private groups will be launching people off of U.S. soil sooner than that. But there is sort of a question of you know, are we going to start playing catch up with other countries that are very anxious to you know, we've we've been the leader in space, and maybe it doesn't matter. You know, as long as we're all sort of working towards that same thing. But we will now maybe be the, you know, until we get back into it, like the third most capable spacefaring nation. <laughs> yeah, two things. One, I tried to get tickets, and one of the biggest problems is delays in schedule. Well, you know, well, that's the thing. Your yeah. flight there and your hotel and all that, and all of a sudden the schedule gets delayed. But the uh, main point I wanted to make, I'm not sure you're aware of the really nice tie-in between the Apollo project and Petaluma. But maybe others here know about it. But uh, um, in fact, we're, we're going to try and do a, a documentary on it. But the old silk mill we have here either did some or all of the cordage for the parachutes for the Apollo the capsules coming back down. Actually, I, I had read about that. I'd forgotten about it until you brought it back up again. But at one time, I had heard about that, which is pretty cool. We did World War II cordage for parachutes. But uh, the Apollo project, uh, some or all of the cordage was done right here. That's, that's pretty amazing. So somebody's got to make new parachute work because we're going to land the same way now. Yeah. <laughs> Place is closed now. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Can you move back to the middle so I can hear you? Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> is that better? Yeah. Okay. Have you thought about uh, putting these photographs in a book? Uh, yes. There's ongoing projects for, you know, part of what I'm actually, you know, some of the first things that I'll try to do with these is, because there is some motion footage and there's audio and there's other things is actually doing some, some multimedia you know, app-based publishing with them so you can interact with the stories a little bit more. But, and also um, there are some fine art print series that I'll be you know, trying to make available. Beautiful photographs integrating the cosmos with the Earth. Oh, thank you. Very beautiful. Another question. Yes. Of all the rockets you observed taking off, which one was the loudest? <laughs> well, the biggest that I was close enough to would have been the shuttle, but the, the Saturn V was probably the loudest, but I was farther away from that. Um, but I was a mile and a half from the first shuttle when it took off, and that was, that was very loud. That, that one you felt in your bones, you know, that, that close. Because uh, you've got those solid rocket motors burning and the main engines. And, uh, yeah, it, it'll, it'll wake you up. <laughs> So I really enjoyed it, um, but I came in when you were, were setting up um, remote cameras. Is that what it was? I think it was the oh, yeah, oh, I never told you what happened with that, did I? <laughs> so, yeah, how did that? Well, okay. You know, and I, I'm in a business, you know, where you make, you triple check, you make sure everything works. Um, and I, I had done this with these cameras. You know, my hotel room looked like a disaster because I had camera bodies and, and the triggers, the audio triggers, and understanding how they worked, and had done all this stuff. Everything was working flawlessly, and got out to the 
and there have been a lot of delays getting out to the, to the pad to set up the cameras. I mean, one of the reasons I only set up two of the cameras was there were lightning storms and we couldn't get out there that day. And finally, one of the escorts said, you, 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 come with me. And we bypassed security and just went out to the pad because I had tripods and no cameras sitting out there. Thought I was not going to get anything out there. Um, at the last minute, just because, just thinking I'm being smart, I put fresh batteries in. Even though the batteries I'd used, I had only tested a little bit. I'd been using them for testing. I thought, well, let's put fresh batteries in. And for some reason, out of the pad, I didn't, I didn't have my battery tester with me. But I didn't think anything of it. I pulled them right out of the packs. Well, those packs were 10 years old. So all of my cameras watched the rockets go up, but they didn't fire a single frame. Fortunately, you know, I also had good gear out at the press site, so I could get all those shots of the liftoff were all from the press site. But, Oh, wow. but, but then how did, how, if it had worked, would, is it wireless, or how, how would you think, I don't know. It's the, actually, the, the, the rig that I was using um, were audio triggers, and so the sound of the liftoff is enough, and all this stuff is set up in waterproof things so that it can hear the sound, but the water won't get in, and it would trigger the cameras, and I went through a lot to make sure that it would trigger them in sync, because I had these stereo pairs trying to go. And, uh, and it all worked beautifully, uh, except for the day of the launch. <laughs> so, uh, you, you know, and the, the, the silver lining I look at is, is even like setting up the cameras. Like I said, I got to take pictures and be in places that I wouldn't otherwise have been if I wasn't setting up the cameras. But it's not like there was another launch I could go try it out on, you know. <laughs> that, was, that was it. That was the last one. So, but, uh, but I, I have some big plans for the, for the future launches coming up. So, one more question. Where is this? Oh, sorry, this is New, this is New Mexico. Um, you know where uh, Truth or Consequences New Mexico is? I don't, so we're in Santa Fe. Oh, it's, it's, it's sort of in the uh, southern, middle southern part of New Mexico. Below Albuquerque. Yeah, uh, yes, below Albuquerque. And it's, um, it's like about 20 miles out of Truth or Consequences. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's, a lot, of, there's a, a lot of space culture going on there, you know, more of the space aliens culture, but it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't know that you can get, this is so, uh, the facility itself, I don't know if it's open to the public, I sort you know, I think, you know, if you drop a few million dollars, I think no problem, but they booked up, uh, kind of, uh, I went out with these archaeologists and, and, but although our, I, I didn't, um, I wasn't able to get, the, involved these guys early enough to get all the full approvals to go into there, unfortunately they were doing their digs just on the perimeters outside, so this is actually from the front security gate, uh, shooting in, but yeah. But a cool location, yeah, so. Oh, come on, more questions. <laughs> um, I actually don't have them on there. I mean, they're actually, they're on the wall here, so you'll be able to, to see them. I it just, it, what, you know, I, I underestimated how many images I was going to go through to put this together. And I, I, I got to get this done. And so, and since they were on the wall, I have to, uh, rather than be late talking to you, I <laughs> Would, uh, would, uh, Did you get to meet and talk to some of the astronauts at all? Uh, they had, they were there doing all these interviews. Um, yeah, I talked to a couple of them. Um, I wasn't doing any formal interviews with them because um, I mean that's one of those things. Everybody's doing all of this stuff, and I, you know, for myself, I was looking for some different perspectives and, you know, more, more longer-term stories. And there were, um, but we're, yeah, they were talking to us in groups, and then you could grab. There was an endless line of appointments with astronauts you could make to do interviews for you know all these uh, different purposes. So, yeah. Your photographs were published in the Press Democrat newspaper, but where else? Um, these these shuttle images actually the only um, I mean I've posted them as part of a blog that I that I do, and they will going forward they'll probably be part of some multimedia works and some uh, maybe some you know fine art prints and book publishing, but uh, uh, as part of a bigger story about you know because. You know, some of the space stuff. But uh, the general public has only been through the press Democrat. Yeah. Do you know uh, if uh, once the, the shuttle landed, if the tiles were still really hot or had they cooled down from the plane slowing down? Um, I don't know. I, you know, I would imagine they, they, because it isn't that long after that they have to have some kind of temperature, but I don't know if they're like, super hot. I mean, certainly they don't let. I mean, nobody go, they, actually, they don't even let the astronauts out until they've sec the, that orbiter recovery team has secured the thing, and that takes like a few hours, so, so, it, so it's a while. So I, I would imagine there's probably some, between the fuel and, and that, it's, it's kind of hostile outside the ship for a while. <laughs>
So when the photographs that you had where the shuttle was already up in the clouds and have this wonderful vapor, mm -hmm. so you stitched that together. Oh, because it was just too wide a view, so I... Oh, I, I, it's just like panorama stitching software that, you know, so that, so it's effectively, it's one image, it's just they weren't all taken with one, yeah. at one instant, they're taken within a few instances of each other, right? Yeah. So, you know, just in, in the spirit of, of, of full disclosure that we are all, <laughs> that we are all, <laughs> you know, but it's, uh, well, and, you know, and I have, I'm very conscious of this idea of, of people understanding, you know, is the content real, you know, there's content versus presentation, you know, and, there, and there's a gray area even in presentation if you go too far. And for me, you know, for especially with this kind of stuff, being able to, you know, even though I might be presenting, you know, I'm definitely trying to make the images, you know, reflect a focus and a point of view, but I'm not screwing around with the content, you know, so. How lucky you were that I was very intrigued that you said because that the Press Democrat has such a wide readership, you got a ticket in. Oh no, these poor guys in the press, I mean, they were literally up all night going through the list, whittling it down, just stressed out because they knew that they were, there were a lot of angry people that just assumed they'd be able to go out to the... But across the entire United States, we have more leadership here in our newspaper than a lot of other people. Well, of the people that, yeah, we, it's, you know, it was like 300,000 or something, you know, and, and that's the reach oh, of the press. Yeah. yeah. And of the, uh, of the press that were there, you know, they were going through where they thought, you know, the images would get the most play. And, you know, fortunately I had an outlet for those images, you know, which was great. You know, I, was, I felt really fortunate, you know. Good so. question. Regarding cameras, how you deal with upgrade titles? Every, every couple of months a better camera comes out <laughs> and you feel this urge to ditch the old one and get a new one out. Not that, not that fast. Because, um, you know, at some point, you only need so much resolution. Um, there's always things you're looking for, like, you know, pretty soon you won't need to bracket exposures to get over and under exposure things. I mean, it'll, you know, the sensors will be better so you can see more like what your eye sees, you know. You won't have to manipulate the image, it'll just be in the image. And, you know. So there's, things, there's always changes going on with camera, camera code, but um, I, you know, I, if, if something's still working, I'll keep using it. You just don't want to be caught out when it turns into a paperweight. <laughs> But you don't go like, if I just had a better camera, I would have gotten ahead an even better shot. Uh, no, I've, I've been very happy with, you know, I'll, I'll drag it out for a while because, you know, it's, they're, not, they're not cheap these days, you know, although they're getting cheaper. Well, and I feel comfortable because I did recently upgrade last year on some things. <laughs> so I'm not feeling any pressure. Okay. But I did, I tell you, know, I take my time. I take my time. Anything else? Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing the like, oh, yes. incredible photos. You mentioned earlier you had like one foot in like kind of the special effects realm, one like photojournalism. Yeah. And um, I, I'd like to hear you speak more about like the special effects <laughs> side. Um, maybe like what uh, like an upcoming project or maybe um, some like cool story from recent. All, all those movies you brought up were all really good special effects movies too. So. Yeah, yeah. Now, as, well, as far as what's next, um, I'm actually between things and talking to a lot of people, so um, I'm not sure yet. And the way you know the way the business is, especially with how expensive it is to actually do the work in California, you never know if you'll have to be spending most of your time in some other country at this point because of all the tax incentives. So you know, even though you're based out of California, sometimes, uh, well, like when I did work for for what a digital on King Kong, I you know, basically lived in New Zealand for eight months. And uh, you know, now that my daughter's in college, it's a little easier for my wife to come you know, spend time. So it's, I don't, I don't wanna, you never wanna move for a project because it's just, it'll land and you're back there. So, uh, but I, I, I push for this idea of sort of co-location. <laughs> Sometimes people don't think you're committed when you do that, but you know, it's, <laughs> um, but as far as, you know, God, it's, it's uh, stories, it's like they're all, I mean, the interesting thing about, you know, all this stuff is that there's just, you know, while there's a lot of buzz and it's very visible and stuff, it, it's just people really, you know, I've been really fortunate, most of the people I've worked with, they're just trying to do a good job and they take a lot of pride in the work they're doing and it just happens to be in this thing that sometimes is, is more visible, but they're, they're, you know, but they're, you know, they're working just sort of, actually the, the one ironic thing I thought was because we were crazy hours in visual effects sometimes. And, you know, you try to be smarter and not do it, but like, 
on the matrix the last three months, actually, or two and a half, three months, we worked almost 120 hours a week. Um, or the movie wasn't gonna get done. And you will die if you do that in two months. I mean, you just can't do that. But I realized that by the time the shuttle had landed, and I finished that, and then realized, oh, okay, there was this one more opportunity to go see the, uh, the new Orion craft. And I went to bed that night. I had been up for 60 hours. <laughs> I had a five minute nap in there somewhere, but that was all, you know. And, and if I had been doing that, if I would never have done that on film. So I, I, it had to have been a drowning or something, because I just, I mean, I've, it just seems ridiculous to me. <laughs> I keep doing the math over, did I really? It's like, yeah, I guess I did. But, uh, but, but no, it's, uh, I mean, people are pretty normal, you know, they're pretty normal people. There's, uh, God, I don't know. I'm on the spot, I don't, you know. I, I thought it was interesting you were uh, working on Jurassic Park right when stop motion animation kind of bumped into like computer animation and Spielberg must have gone with the computer animation. But I, I did see kind of a behind the scenes, uh, like some kind of DVD bonus. Yeah. yeah. Every time they, that, that crew showed up, I was in a meeting somewhere else. They were in my office. I was like, I'm never going to be in any of these things. I just have bad, bad uh, doco. But, uh, but yeah, like, you, you must have been there for the transition into. And you, you have like this well-developed eye. I wonder if it bugs you when you see stuff that's too CG. Yeah, and I think there's, there's a lot of... I mean, this effects just for effects sake is, you know, you, you kind of hate to see it. I mean, one of the things that was nice about, say, a Forrest Gump was it wasn't about the effects. It was a story. And it's, and I think, you know, well, just this year we went down and I remember the, uh, the Academy and get to vote on the, on the visual effects films and on the other films, but we screen, I'm part of the visual effects branch, and we screen, you know, like the short, the, the, what they call the long list of the 10 films that are most, that will be narrowed down for the nomination. And they're all really well done big effects movies, and, but it all starts to look the same. Like, bigger isn't better, you know, you still, if there's, there's got to be a story, you got to care. What was that, the movie, um, um, The Whole End of the World 2012, you know, all this massive destruction going on, amazing, I mean, the effects work was, I know it was brutal and hard, it was beautiful work. You didn't care about anybody that was in trouble because the movie d d didn't do that. And I. And I you know, it's, it's nice when effects are part of helping tell a story and not the story. You know, I, and, and smaller, well, like last year, I think, uh, Life of Pi, where, you know, that, that tiger, 90% of the time is a CG tiger in that movie, even when he's interacting with his hands. And most of the time, you're not sure, I mean, intellectually, you know it's supposed to be, and it was too dangerous a situation, but, what was a standout is it was a very human interactive thing going on there with this creature. You didn't think about the CG. It wasn't a big effect. It was a, a, a sublime effect, I guess, in that sense. And to me, that's really using it for the most part the, the right way. You know, I mean, that's sort of what excites me about some of these different media coming together is that it, it starts to get back again to the whole idea of, you know, whatever, whether it's cinematic footage or still images that are, you know, as viable as they've ever been now. Actually, you know, the digital media has made still photography more, more viable. That whatever that is, but it's still, you know, there's so much media that it really has to boil down to, do I care about what I'm seeing? And at that point, it doesn't even have to look, I mean, YouTube is a good example. It doesn't have to be quality. People just have to get engaged. So, and it's really nice when it's quality, and, you know, you take pride in it, you'd like to see that, but it's, you know, what other things do and I don't think I ever answered your real question. <laughs> 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 I'll, we'll talk, we'll hang out. <laughs> so what, what other things do you photograph? Um, I, I do a diversity of things. I mean, in my photography, I like to um, focus on an exploration of the world. To me, photography has always been a tool to explore the world and experience the world. Whereas in film and cinema, you're making up your world and you're creating it and you're crafting it. And so that's what I, in some ways, that's sort of my release from that world and that is I, from a creative point of view, it's about discovery and, and seeing things, you know, putting a lens up or wanting to tell a story allows me to sort of explore and discover in ways that 
you know, I wouldn't necessarily do in some other way. And, and that refreshes my other sort of creative palette as well because it's so completely different. But what else do you photograph? So what do I photograph? Um, I, li I like, you know, so by way of that, it's sort of, it's very editorial oriented. I mean, I, I, I shoot landscapes and I, I love, you know, there's parts of me that love just the beauty of composition and then landscape and still lifes and that sort of thing. But the other part of me, I'm completely schizophrenic, the other part of me loves the editorial part where it's a story about people and things that are going on and what they're doing. And it's, and it's such a completely different way of, of seeing. Like if I'm going to photo, you know, go on the street and just photograph people and strangers and walk up to them and get engaged, I, I have to consciously decide to do that. Once I'm in that mode, it's very easy, but it's not something that I come by naturally. But once I'm there, I, it's, it's a lot of fun. Actually, people are really great. They're very, it's amazing how receptive people are when they, you know, when you actually start engaging with them, even if you don't know them. But, um, but that's very different than, say, you know, there's some photographers that like landscapes and still lifes and things that don't involve having to confront you know, other people because those are sa sort of safe ways. And it's also a different kind of vision. It's, it's a more design vision, you know, very graphic kind of a thing. So part of it, you know, I, I have that piece that I enjoy very much, but I think I would be at a loss if um, there wasn't that stuff. And some of what I didn't show a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of photographs of rockets and stuff, but there's a lot more stuff of, you know, the people, like I said, I like the stuff going on behind the scenes, the reporters themselves and, the stories and that, you know, I went into Titusville after the launch and was talking to people in the parking lots of, about what they, you know, had experienced and done going into gift shop. It just would have made this all way too long. So, so interacting with people is, is, a, is a lot of fun. <laughs>